ambassadors, so we were having a board meeting in a circle, and they said, some of you had to talk about the history of social policy in the United States. And they said, well, that, that's probably got to be the oldest person in the room. So, <laughs> <laughs> so here I am. Okay, so first you get the gym theory of social change. But the three big drivers in any society are demography, the demographer, demographers like to say demography is destiny, the composition of the population, how many people are old, how many people are young, etc. The second is the economy, which includes science and technology, a lot of science and technology in the last hundred years or so. And the social values are the beliefs of the population. And where these intersect out there in the middle is uh, what I call the weak force. Public policy uh, also includes uh, the independent sector, uh, the foundations, the nonprofits, etc. We often like to think of ourselves as leading social change, but very often we are chasing social change, uh, trying to offset something that's happened in one of the strong driver arenas. So public policy in particular, uh, especially in the United States with our structure of government, uh, typically lags behind changes in these other three areas anywhere from five years to 200 years. Only about 50% of uh, things that people believe should be done ever get done. Uh, the public policy often just is unable to deal with uh, major issues. Um, and public policy often gets it wrong. Our immigration policy has been a disaster since 1882. When the first laws about immigration were put in place, the public charge rule went in not uh, six months ago, like some of us this first discovered it, it went in in 1882, when the U.S. Congress said, we're not let men, people who are sick and crippled and so forth, uh, we're going to put them right on the boat and send them home. So uh, another uh, aspect uh, of this, and for the 8% of American males who are <coughs> green and colorblind, <coughs> I apologize for the fact that those are the only two color markers. <laughs> but uh, in, the, in the public policy or uh, in any corrective action uh, has got some good dimensions to it. That's why we do it. It usually has a couple of bad things that it does. Uh, it has limits. It can only go so far and it's not going to do much more. Uh, it's got opportunity cost. Uh, if you're doing this, you can't be doing something else at the same time. Uh, and it has unintended consequences. Those squirrels that jump out uh, and land on your head three to five to ten years later, that nobody saw coming, but there they are. So the three big drivers, uh, the, the strong forces, if we were thinking in physics terms, the weak forces of government uh, and philanthropy, uh, and then the weak forces out there, even the stuff that we do, uh, uh, frequently has some loading on the good, bad, limits, opportunity, cost, unintended, consequences, uh, dimensions. So, um, there are nine basic theories of social change and the structure that I used uh, uh, for this workshop. I just dis I discovered when I was printing this out, I've done this five different ways. So the one that I picked for today is called punctuated equilibrium. Things go along for a while, and then uh, uh, anomalies, countervailing forces appear, uh, tension builds, and there's some great reshuffling. Uh, these great reshufflings happen every 30 to 50 years uh, in America. Uh, we're probably in the middle of one now. Uh, we had one 30 years ago in the Reagan uh, administration. We had one 20 years before that in the Johnson administration. So it, it, I think the the frequency of these things is uh, increasing. But if we go back to the founding, the, the, when the first people landed here, the religious cults that were fleeing England, the Quakers uh, and the Puritans, uh, because they were being chased around uh, by the English church that had split off from the Catholic church. And so they decided, well, come to America. We can practice our religious beliefs uh, unimpaired. Uh, they showed up, uh, slavery showed up soon after and then when we look at the great socialist countries, China, Vietnam, Mexico, where the government owns all the land and gives it out either according to bureaucratic rules or they give it to their friends um, or they give it to the highest bidder um, uh, or they give it away for free for some crazy reason. 
Uh, if we look at America initially, when the country was set up, the government owned all the land. However, where did the government get the land? It took it from the Native Americans, right? It says, this is land this is our land now. A little funny story about that. My wife and I were in Canada and we're in this bar and they have karaoke. We've never done karaoke. So we decide to do karaoke. So we turn on the karaoke, we get the list, you know, with the A17 and whatever. So we get up and we sing, this land is my land, this land is our land. <laughs> and we couldn't figure out why these Canadians were all giving us the hard email. <laughs> oh, <laughs> 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 unintended consequence. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Anyhow, so the government takes the land from the Native Americans and then the government starts giving it away. Uh, this is after they'd acquired it from the French, you know, uh, from the, took it from the Spanish. Uh, took it from the British, uh, bought it from the French, etc., uh, and consolidated it into the lower, what we call the lower 48. <clears throat> the government starts giving the land away. They give the land to the railroads. You know, we're going to draw a line on the map, railroad, uh, that's yours, and everything within 200 yards or half a mile or whatever it was on either side of it belongs to you now. You can go. And they give it to homesteaders. People go out and get a quarter section, get 160 acres, and as long as you live there for three years and did some. Sort of improvement or something like that. I'm not too I'm not big on details. I'm a big picture down here. <laughs> so uh, as long as you did that, uh, you could uh, keep the land. The land became yours. So uh, as this was uh, going on in the early days, you know, we have a, a lot of our uh, sort of emotional concepts of America were formed back then. Uh, you go out and you help your neighbors raise the barn. You know, they all get together and help each other. Uh, for the most part, though, you were on your own. You're out there on the prairie in the winter in a sod hut. Uh, you better have some animals in there to keep you warm because if, uh, uh, if you didn't chop enough firewood uh, to last through the winter, you were in serious, serious trouble. So there really was a spirit of individualism and independence. And, uh, we can do it ourselves. And uh, I can take care of myself. And, uh, and on, the, on the other hand, you had some uh, church church groups that formed sometimes communities for uh, people who uh, were a particular religious denomination that came together. The Lutherans are famous for this in the more central part of the U.S., etc. Uh, but the, these communities formed uh, agrarian and resource extraction communities. Uh, the whole industrialization thing didn't really uh, ever take off until the 1850s, 1860s when the railroads went in uh, and in the late 1800s when but I'm getting ahead of myself. Wait a minute, let's see. We're going to talk about Oh, okay. <laughs> so uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to talk about up to the Civil War, uh, and then the Civil War uh, into the early uh, 1900s, and then the 1900s, and this is what I call the high school movement, uh, the First World War, uh, the Fourth Era, or the 50s and the 60s was our era when we used to be studying this war. And, uh, and then the, the seeds of the fifth era appeared in the late 70s uh, and have been uh, accelerating for that. Uh, but the economy in the very early days, as I say, was resource extraction, chop, cut, dig, etc. Uh, the, the earth is a bountiful, the, earth, the resources are endless, we can do whatever we want out there. Uh, if there's uh, any waste products, etc., just stop them in the stream and they if you like. This mentality uh, formed back in the very earliest days, unfortunately, still underlies a significant aspect of the belief system of most Americans. You push way down deep when you find the stuff that we learned uh, uh, in grade school uh, and in high school or, or at the uh, family dinner table. My wife's a psychologist and she says, you are who you were at when you were 10 years old uh, because everything that you heard from your loved ones and the people that you feared and loved and respected went in on the tape and it's still there, she said. You may not know it's there and you've forgotten that they ever talked about this, but it's there. <laughs> you know? You've got to find it and deal with it uh, you know, one way or the other. Okay, so here we go into the 1830s. Uh, most states go broke. Uh, the, uh, Andrew Jackson is moving the Cherokees from uh, Georgia. Uh, to uh, Oklahoma, thinking he's uh, 
get them out of the way of all those nice people in Georgia, those nice white people in Georgia, and we're going to move them over to uh, uh, that worthless piece of land in Oklahoma, which turned out to be one of the largest oil deposits in the United States. Unintended consequence. There you go. <laughs> so, uh, other things were going on in the private sector among beliefs and values. Uh, the Puritans, who like to punish people, put them in the stocks and so forth. Uh, the Quakers didn't like that. The Quakers thought that people given time to reflect uh, would, of course, uh, realize the error of their ways and adjust their behavior uh, accordingly. Uh, so, the Quakers created places of penitence. The places of penitence, the first one was in Pennsylvania, and of course in the 1830s, consisted of a central tower where a couple of staff people sat there and had wings going off of it, uh, where there were rooms where people could sit in solitary contemplation of their errors and so forth. So they placed the penitence they decided to call a penitentiary. Right? So the penitentiaries were created by Quakers for the best of intentions, right? Good, right? Uh, in the 1830s, uh, and, and uh, a sudden mistake uh, uh, that stayed with us for 170 years. Uh, then in the, uh, the Civil War, of course, was a great disruptor in America. At the time of the Civil War, two-thirds of the wealth in the South was in the form of human beings owned by other human beings. So with the Emancipation Proclamation, Proclamation, etc., Lincoln wiped out two thirds of the economic worth uh, of people uh, in the South. And besides the war itself, uh, uh, and the, uh, in addition to the war itself, the after effects of the war were that many of the plantations imploded because the people who had owned them uh, were killed or, or displaced. So the federal government once again said, Look at all this land that we've got now to redistribute. Uh, we're going to redistribute this land by giving it to former slaves, uh, giving it to people who are indentured servants. Uh, so they created the Freedman's Bureau. Uh, the Freedman's Bureau in the 1860s, the first of the three great federal initiatives, the first being the Freedman's Bureau, uh, the second being the Farm Security Administration, the Depression, the third being the War on Poverty in the 60s. We had these three great interventions by the federal government to offset and compensate uh, problems that existed in the society, in the economy, and in the social belief uh, and values uh, systems. So the Freedman's Bureau uh, was very interesting. Uh, uh, it was run by a former major general uh, who was 30, uh, 35 years old. Uh, they hired uh, several thousand uh, feds. I've been here 900, but they actually hired about 3,000 feds. Uh, almost all former army officers in the Union Army. These 3,000 feds went into the South and they set up clinics, they set up schools, and they were to manage the distribution of all this now empty land or confiscated land and to give each former slave 40 acres and a mule. So this was the first great promise that was, uh, uh, like many promises from the federal government, uh, made uh, and then not followed through uh, because the Freedman's Bureau uh, only lasted about uh, uh, <clears throat> 10 years in a private sector out there and at the state government level. And that the conclusion on the part of the great social theorists at the time is what people who are insane need uh, is a, a place to go in nature where they can contemplate the beauties of nature and readjust their personalities and their souls and uh, uh, get straight with themselves and with society. So we'll call these places asylums. It will be a place of uh, retreat and contemplation. So the insane asylum system was created in the 1870s and the system of youth incarceration or wayward use. You know, we'll get all these kids together, we'll put them someplace and we'll give them education and training and they will then uh, uh, be able to go on uh, from there. So, um, unfortunately, at the same time uh, the Freedman's Bureau was, was operating, uh, oh, seven years, 1865 to 1872, 
there was a backlash on the part of the former <coughs> slave owners and on the part of the people in the South in general, and the Jim Crow laws came in. And the, uh, I don't know who Jim Crow was, but he sure had a lot of laws named after him. <laughs> but the Jim Crow law sought to take away uh, the Emancipation Proclamation and the uh, right of blacks to vote in the 14th Amendment. And they chipped away at it uh, through um, uh, requirements that people pay a poll tax, and people didn't have cash, they were still working a largely barter economy, uh, and or requirements for literacy, uh, which was a severe problem because uh, in the era of slavery, uh, there was systematic efforts to prevent slaves from learning to read and write. Um, and so here, slaves are freed, and all of a sudden there's a state law that you have to be literate in order uh, to vote, and of course, former slaves uh, couldn't, uh, couldn't meet. So Jim Crow came creeping back in uh, in the 1870s, uh, institutionalized into the early 1900s, actually, uh, and depriving the former slaves uh, of what they had, in theory, been given uh, by the uh, federal government. Uh, there was another inter very interesting thing that happened in the late 1890s. Uh, the so-called progressive era. I grew up in Kansas, you know, and the Kansas farmers led the revolt against the banks. Uh, and uh, the progressive era uh, came in and people began demanding that governments, state and local governments in particular, institute uh, civil service procedures where you had a written job description, the jobs didn't just go to your cronies and family, that they went to people who took a task and met certain qualifications. And so, in the progressive era in the 1890s, instituted the concept of contracts uh, that were formal, written down, made public, uh, all this new, uh, in, uh, for the most part, in America. Uh, and so, good government uh, began uh, uh, creeping in. Uh, the Settlement House movement. Uh, very interesting, started in Chicago. A substantial number of good things started in Chicago. One was the Settlement House Movement. And it was called the Settlement House Movement because the white, educated women who started it uh, would settle in a immigrant community and work with those immigrants at the time, almost all white, Polish, uh, Lithuanian, uh, Russian, German, etc. And would uh, uh, work with them on acculturation, inculturation, learning how to live in America, learning the language, uh, learning uh, how to uh, find a job uh, or create a job. Uh, so the settlement house movement was very popular, uh, and by the early 1900s, there were about 300 settlement houses uh, around the country. And the precursor, uh, in a lot of ways, to the war. The war on poverty. Uh, the first real, what we would call uh, analysis or evaluation of social policy occurred in the 1890s. Uh, Debbie T. B. Du Bois, uh, the first a black PhD graduate from Harvard, uh, wrote a book uh, about the Philadelphia Negro, which he analyzed the plight of, of former slaves and looked at the reasons why the former slaves were having such a, a great difficulty. And he said there are four reasons why the poverty exists. And I'm on page two at the top here. One is just rapid migration. People are moving around so fast in America, they don't have time to put down the roots uh, and create the social connections, uh, the social capital that's necessary for you to have a productive life. Um, the second is rapid industrialization. The machinery and the methods of production are changing so fast that the workers just can't keep up. Uh, and then in the third case, uh, uh, he called the, the after effects of slavery, uh, where families were discouraged, uh, literacy was discouraged, etc. cetera. Um, and he said these are persisting 30 years later. Um, and we are still feeling the effects of the policies that were in effect regarding slaves now, uh, after slavery has ended. And then he said a perplexing dimension of life in America, racism, to a degree, he said, that was not present in most other societies where there had been slavery and slavery ended. 
I mean, look at many of the societies of the Middle East, uh, Greece, uh, some of the other Mediterranean border countries where there have been slaves, but at the point slavery ended there, the slaves were largely incorporated into the rest of society and permitted to live on a more or less equal basis. He said that that's not happening in America, this racism thing that's happening here. Is, uh, uh, he, thought, he thought it was unique to America. Turns out, he, he may have overstated it a little bit, some of these other societies weren't all that, uh, uh, all that good <clears throat> in that regard. Okay, so a lot of other things happened at the turn of the century. Uh, there used to be people that went around in covered wagons and sold all kinds of uh, poisonous substances out of the back of the wagons, uh, and the form that was going to make you strong, or you're going to destroy your hair, or you lose weight, or be more rural, or whatever. And half of the stuff was literally killing people. And they finally figured that out. Uh, and then the meatpacking industries, uh, and they, at the turn of the century, were uh, pools of bacteria. Uh, being transmitted to the paying customers on the, uh, after the animals were killed. So there was a whole wave of reform measures in the 1900 to 1912 period by government to regulate what was going on in the economy. To, uh, the Food and Drug Administration was created. Uh, the meat inspection system was created. And all of a sudden, a lot fewer people were dying, uh, were not dying. I'm not gonna, am I doing this right? <laughs> Fewer people were dying. <laughs> so also in the early part of the 20th century, the end of the National Association for Advancement of the Colored People was formed. Uh, w. E. B. Du Bois was one of the founders. Uh, the Urban League was formed. Uh, and uh, the great benefit of all my ancestors, the high school movement started. Suddenly, basic literature elementary school was no longer enough. You had to have a high school diploma. So this idea started around 1910, went to fruition in the 1920s. So all of my ancestors graduated with a high school diploma because that was the desired norm. And with a high school diploma, as late as 1970, you could get a good job. You could get a job at the minimum wage, uh, on the line, maybe you had benefits. Uh, and that family would move out of poverty. So a high school diploma used to be enough uh, to move a family um, out of uh, poverty. Uh, and also in the early 1900s, the concept of social work uh, was developed at the universities, University of Chicago, et cetera, uh, and became a formal part uh, of college uh, curriculum. Uh, so the first cash payments to widows were done in Illinois in 1912. Uh, coming out of Hall House, uh, the settlement house in Chicago, uh, that Hall House started advocating for this. Some of the women there uh, themselves took money out of their own pockets and gave it to the people who were going through Hall House. And they said, why don't we get the state legislature to do this? And so 15 years later, not a bad period of time for a piece of state legislation, uh, they did. And the, uh, the first payments, I think, were a dollar and a half a month or something like that and went to widows uh, who uh, were unable to have children and couldn't care for themselves, other people. And so by the time the Aid to Dependent Children Program and Social Security were created in the 1930s, uh, there were 17 states that provided for some form uh, of payment. So World War I also changed the ideas about what soldiers are entitled. Uh, in theory, after the Civil War, Union soldiers, anyhow, were to receive certain benefits in the form of health benefits and so forth. Uh, <clears throat> there were a fairly limited number of people uh, who this affected after the Civil War, because in the Civil War, if you were seriously injured, uh, whether with a bayonet or a musket ball or a falling tree branch, uh, you probably died because of the bacteria, you get a bacterial infection uh, and you were 80% uh, of the soldiers who were wounded uh, just died. <clears throat> but uh, the idea about the society owes a certain group of people for the service they provided to the society started in rough form uh, in the Civil War, uh, began to grow a little bit uh, in the first, uh, first World War, uh, and, and really took off after the Second World War, but, but we'll get there. Okay, so the 1930s, I got the wrong number here. 
1933, the NAACP Legal Defense and Education Fund adopted a strategic plan to end segregation. I have $100,000, but it was actually a million dollars, an enormous sum of money uh, at the time. They hired a young lawyer named Thurgood Marshall um, mm -hmm. and a few other lawyers, and they started chipping away at the institution, at the Jim Crow laws and the institutionalized form of segregation. Uh, at, the, at the local level, and particularly focusing on schools and uh, little tiny lawsuits here and there. This was a 20 year strategic plan, they said, uh, that we will uh, pursue through these lower courts, building a case record that we will then accumulate up to the Supreme Court. Uh, and they did. That's exactly what happened. Took them 20 years to do it, uh, leading into the 1954 Brown versus uh, Board of Education uh, decision. A 20 year plan can, in fact, work. I heard that guy from San Diego when I saw him. Okay. So the New Deal uh, saw some in the 30s, uh, one of the other great reshufflings here that punctuated equilibrium, all kinds of things uh, changing around. Up to this point, the general public believed that the federal government had no role in regulating the economy, that Adam Smith's invisible hand was what uh, was regulating the economy. Uh, another load of nonsense that Americans believe, and many still do, but I do they have something So the idea at the end of the 30s uh, that the invisible hand was what was con should control the economy, the private interactions between people, what the marketplace rule, etc. Uh, and then uh, the depression hit. Uh, clearly, the invisible hand was not working. 25% of people were unemployed. Enormous numbers of people had to leave. Throw in the bad farming practices that led to the Dust Bowl um, in the uh, Midwest. Union Pacific Railroad reported 700,000 people riding their boxcars from Oklahoma to California in 1934. <coughs> so uh, one of the ways you got around it, you didn't have a car, couldn't afford a train ticket, uh, you jumped on a train and saw whole families are riding the rail, so to speak, trying to find a better uh, opportunity. So <clears throat> here we go, this, uh, after the Freedman's Bureau, the second great intervention by the federal government around poverty issues, uh, the Farm Security Administration from 1935 to 43, uh, directed by a professor called Rexford Tugwell, named Rexford Tugwell, friend of FDR's, uh, and they uh, put 15,000 people, they hired 15,000 feds, in addition to the Works Progress Administration, Public Works Administration, uh, and they, uh, employment programs that hired several million people, built the Golden Gate Bridge out where I live, and the, the Grand, what's called the Grand Cooley Dam? No, the Hoover Dam. Mm -hmm. that big dam? Mm -hmm. And then there's a lot of stuff. Well, do that again, in my opinion. <clears throat> but anyhow, uh, the um, Farm Security Administration hired 15,000 people and put them out in the uh, rural areas in particular, kind of like Vista volunteers, to work with farmers who were in trouble either because the banks were taking the farm, all my ancestors were farmers, they all lost the farms in the Depression, uh, or um, in trouble because of the drought, and to help people stay on the land. The idea was try to keep people on the ground rather than joining these great migrations uh, that were occurring. At the same time, the cotton gin in the South was taking hundreds of thousands to millions of jobs from people who were sharecroppers who have uh, either grown their own crops or worked the fields. And so you had a couple of million blacks moving north uh, out of the south. Uh, and the Prime was set up migrant camps uh, for the migrant workers. Uh, one of these is still operating in California. It's a great thing. And at the same time, there was a group of professors up at the University of Chicago and I said, we need a way to keep youth uh, integrated into society. We've got all these wayward youth. We've got all these gangs of youth. What do we do to keep youth integrated into society? Let's get everybody together, the churches, the employers, uh, uh, the uh, government people, 
uh, the private sector, the nonprofit sector. Let's get everybody in the community together and come up with ways to reduce juvenile delinquency by getting uh, these youth connected to educational opportunities, to socialization opportunities. We'll call this a program of community action. Uh, so this program of community action started in Chicago in the 1930s. Uh, one of the people who was an uh, employee there, a graduate student at the uh, University of Chicago, a young fellow named Saul Alinsky, said, uh, this is a bad idea. And he said, this is way too wussy. You're not going after the sources of the problem, which is locally entrenched power structures. You've got to take these power structures head on uh, through people power. So he created the Industrial Areas Foundation, uh, the, the Catholic Bishop of Chicago, uh, a wealthy uh, department store owner, and a couple of other people. And so Saul Linsky and the IAF, uh, the Industrial Areas Foundation, had this grassroots community organizing theory of how you generate social change in America and adjust the social inequities. And when I went into the Office of Economic Opportunity in the 1960s, Literally, every day, we debated the difference between these two theories of change. Do you get everybody together and talk it out and come up with ways that everybody agrees to, or do you organize a group of people and go down and pick at City Hall and, um, and so forth? Anyhow, uh, the Farm Security Administration uh, uh, and, uh, uh, was an early precursor to the Community Action Agency. The Program of Community Action, another early precursor. Uh, these were picked up uh, by the Ford Foundation uh, in the uh, 40s. Uh, at the, in the, the other big uh, adjustment in, in the 40s, and I'm going to talk about the Second World War in a minute, a, gun, a, a Swedish fellow named Gunnar Myrdal writes a book, An American Dilemma, uh, which was sort of an update of the W.E.B. Du Bois theory about what was the nature of the circumstance of minorities in general in America, and blacks in particular in America. Now, maybe this is a good place to, to step off and say, when you look at the history of immigration in the United States, this is a sorry uh, commentary on uh, social values and a belief system about everybody's created equal, everybody deserves a chance, etc. Because from the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1886, that says, okay, we're not going to let any more. We brought in all these Chinese to build the railroads in the 1850s and 60s, but we don't really want them anymore. So what we'll do is we'll say they can't own property and they can't vote and so forth. And then you look at this waves of immigrants coming in from the Irish potato famine, you know, and uh, every wave of immigrants that's come into America, if you look back at the sordid history of it, has been vilified by the people who are already here. So you have the Chinese, then you have the Irish, then you have the Germans, then you have the Jews, um, then you have the Italians, then you have Catholics in general. So you roll up through the late 1800s and the early 1900s, and every wave that comes in is blamed for the social problems in the country, is blamed for degrading the quality of life in the country, etc. With the, the schizophrenia in the people uh, who are already here so, you know, people come in, the Italians, I mean, the Irish come in and they get filled apart, you know, low class people, not literate at all, they want to do some potatoes, blah, blah, blah. So, so then the Irish are here for 30 years, and so then the Germans start showing up, so then the Irish are vilifying the Germans. I mean, it's really strange stuff when you look at it. And then the Immigration Act of 1926 basically barred people from uh, the world who were not European. Um, and it set all kinds of quotas for the number of people who can immigrate legally. In the meantime, of course, you've got all this illegal stuff, uh, undocumented, we say now, but we don't say illegal anymore, right? We say undocumented, right? <clears throat> and undocumented flows back and forth across this incredibly porous uh, southwestern border. Uh, and remember, this is land that the U.S. took uh, from Mexico, uh, who had taken it from the Spanish. Uh, in the early 1800s, and now, uh, you know, all these Spanish descendant people who were living there. Oh, I've got a great story, by the way, about why Portuguese is spoken in Brazil. Maybe I'll get to that. <laughs> I have no idea what time it is, by the way. <laughs> How much time have I got? Who's my timekeeper? 40 minutes. 
40 minutes? Oh man, I'm just getting warmed up here. <laughs> okay. Uh, so World War II, of course, uh, changed uh, uh, the economy operated. Uh, all of a sudden, Kaiser Aluminum is not making those new aluminum beer cans anymore. They're making ships. Uh, and women are basically building these ships. Men, able-bodied men, are uh, drafted and gone. Women are building these ships. At one point, in the uh, Kaiser shipyards in Oakland uh, and the Bay Area in California, they were turning out a ship a day. Uh, and it was just an enormous, you know, 100,000 women working. Uh, and the, the Rosie the Riveter Museum is worth a trip, let me tell you. That's worth a special trip to go out there and see how that restructured the American economy. And so this idea that women can do any job that men can do, up to that point, was inconceivable. And all of a sudden, the necessity of war, it was happening. You know, within like a three-year period, it was happening. But this other idea that the society owed it to soldiers uh, who fought on behalf of uh, the society, this is like, really took hold after World War II. And so you had the uh, uh, Farmers Home Administration was created, uh, the Federal Housing Administration was created, uh, the GI Bill enabled uh, uh, men who had been soldiers to go to college for free, uh, basically. Uh, and uh, uh, the, there was a Full Employment Act of 1946 passed through the Comfort was one of the sponsors, uh, laying out how we're going to move America to a form of economy and a structure of society where everybody who wants to work can work, everybody will be able to make a living and provide for their family. Then you implemented like many of the things that happened at the federal level that either are only partially implemented or implemented for a little while uh, and then dropped um, uh, that uh, one of the un unfulfilled aspirations uh, uh, of the federal government. So we move into the early uh, 1950s, where uh, this is really the golden era, uh, if you will, of America. Almost everybody who wanted a job could find a job. Uh, people were uh, able to buy a house uh, because you could get a federal government uh, guarantee uh, on the mortgage. Not if you were black, of course, but uh, if you were white, you could get a federal uh, mortgage guarantee. So the uh, forms of wealth took off there. <clears throat> Before I leave the Depression, uh, the, uh, 1936, the passage of the Social Security Act. Uh, uh, recognizing that people could not save enough uh, on their own necessarily, so the employer and the person both had an obligation to save for their future of mutual responsibility, uh, and the uh, money would be held in escrow by the federal government. So the Social Security Act passed, and it applies to everybody except people who work uh, in agriculture, people who work uh, uh, in domestic service. And at the time, 80% of people who were blacks worked in agriculture or domestic service. So they said, we're not in the social security system until uh, the 1950s. When we talk about structural racism or institutional racism, uh, and policies that apply to a portion of the population, they claim to apply to everybody, but they really only apply to a portion of the population and not to this portion as an example of uh, uh, what we're talking about. Uh, another thing that passed in the 1930s, almost as an afterthought, was the Aid Dependent Children Program. And I said 17 states uh, were already providing some form of cash assistance to widows or others who were um, the deserving poor. So the deserving poor were left up to the local people uh, and to decide. That was the way Hall House was designed it in Chicago. The other states adopted basically that same system, and so that was written into the federal statute that the determination of who is eligible for receiving aid to dependent children is up to a committee of women at the local level, mostly white social workers, uh, who would decide uh, who the deserving poor were uh, and uh, eligible to receive these cash benefits. Uh, and no, no dissension, no discussion. Big fight over Social Security itself. No fight over aid to dependent children when you read the transcripts. Uh, routine things seem like a good idea, let's do it. Okay, so here's the Ford Foundation picking up the
program of community action and carrying it forward into what they call the gray areas projects. Uh, in New Haven, Connecticut, uh, in the mobilization for youth in the Lower East Side of uh, New York City, there was a third one, I can't remember offhand what it was. Okay, remember gray areas projects, because I'm going to come back to that. Uh, but I still want to stick in the 50s here for a minute because uh, the NAACP 20 year strategic plan was coming to fruition uh, and they had about eight different uh, cases on appeal uh, to the Supreme Court around segregation in uh, public schools and they chose the Topeka, Kansas uh, case, uh, Brown versus Board of Education. Uh, they had psychologists come in reporting on the tests that they had done uh, with black children and white children with dolls about which doll is prettier and which doll uh, do you want to have uh, for lunch and so on and join you for lunch, this kind of thing. And, and the testimony was pretty overwhelming uh, and the Supreme Court ruled that separate is not equal. And uh, so schools began uh, to desegregate. <clears throat> I remember I was a senior in high school in 1958, <gasps> he's really old. <laughs> and President Eisenhower uh, sent, uh, he nationalized the National Guard troops in Arkansas to integrate the public schools in Little Rock, Arkansas. And we thought this is a real turning point when the federal government not only says that something's illegal and it should do something, but the President of the United States sends the army to enforce uh, this was a gigantic uh, cataclysmic event. Now that same year, Eisenhower was in the process of implementing Operation Wetback, in which they deported over a million Mexicans, uh, whole neighborhoods in Los Angeles, uh, and just uh, picked them up and busted them and busted them back across the border and dumped them. Uh, so you know, we talk about immigration and the things that turmoil over integration, when you look into it and start digging into it, has been the case in this country since it started. It's, it's been chaos and mayhem for the new arrivals in particular, in particular <coughs> if they're undocumented, which is the way all my ancestors came to this uh, country. <coughs> you need documentation, just show up and start digging, you know, and start chopping down trees and things. <laughs> Okay, so this idea, separate is not equal, uh, took hold. And people said, well, if separate is not equal in education, maybe it's not equal riding buses either. Yeah. Maybe separate is not equal in public accommodations. Maybe it's not equal in lunch counters, you know. Wasn't it here in Greenville, South Carolina, where the first lunch counter demonstration, or am I thinking Greenville, North Carolina? Not here. Was it here? Woolworth, okay. The, the first uh, group of college students went to the lunch counter, to Woolworths. Is that the museum now? Or did they close it? It was a while for a while, it was a museum, right? And then they... Okay, so it was right here, Greenville, South Carolina. About four or five college students, black college students, so we're going to go have lunch at the Woolworths lunch counter. I don't know if you ever eaten at those old department or dime store lunch counters. I mean, they're really something out of the American past. <laughs> you go to this long formica or, or linoleum counter with stools down it, and the staff or the waitresses are back there in their white uniforms and hats and so forth. They come up and they get a hot pot for a quarter, a, a malt for a dime, and that kind of thing. <clears throat> I mean, it was the original fast food. Went and sat down there. Most of us right there on the counter because they're going to do And so these college students go in and they say, We'd like to be served. And they were well dressed and well behaved and so forth. They went in and said, We'd like to be served. And this created chaos. You know, it was mayhem. You know, it was incredible disruption. The idea that black people could sit in the same stool where white people. I'm going to go find that Woolworths. Was it a Woolworths? Was that what it was? Yes, it was. Yes, it was. Yes, it was. Yes, not Greenville. Not Greenville? Oh, Greenville. It was the start of the Green Revolution. There was one here, but it wasn't. Okay. Okay. Anyhow, it started here somewhere in South Carolina, right? And that was on the public accommodation side. 
So then it was on the transportation side. They had the uh, Freedom Riders the idea that they should be able to ride a bus, uh, an interstate bus, because this is interstate commerce, and interstate commerce is governed by the federal government, and the federal government just said uh, separate is not equal. So my army unit was, my army reserve unit was activated by President Kennedy during the Berlin crisis. We get to Fort McClellan in Anniston, Alabama, home of the Anniston, Alabama Ku Klux Klan. We get to Anniston, Alabama in 1961. Remember, this was before the Civil Rights Movement, really, before the Civil Rights Act. And the Klan had just burnt the Freedom Ride bus right outside the entrance of the post. So there was a big black rectangle where and the Freedom Ride bus had been uh, left Anniston, several black Klan stopped the bus, let everybody off. Good for them, I guess, and the humanitarian gesture. And they burned the bus. So here's this big black rectangle right outside uh, the entrance to our post. That's a whole other story that I'm kind of digressing here. Um, okay, so the civil rights movement, I mean, you, you think of the abolitionists have been around since the start of slavery. Um, the abolitionists, uh, Brewer and Brewer and Brewer, of course, finally got uh, uh, slavery ended. Uh, uh, Two steps back during Jim Crow, lost ground, uh, almost back to as bad as it was, but not quite. Uh, and, and then the Civil Rights Movement takes off uh, TV, Brown versus Board of Education, inspirational leaders like Martin Luther King Jr., et cetera. A, a happy confluence of things happening uh, in the society to uh, cause the Civil Rights Movement to begin making uh, serious uh, uh, inroads. So uh, then we move into the 1960s, a very influential book written by a socialist, a socialist Michael Harrington, uh, called The Other America, uh, read by many of the white liberal politicians. The rumor is that President Kennedy read this book, uh, or maybe he only read the book review by Homer Bigard in the New York Times of this book, but he knew about this book. So he began talking about what can we do to compensate uh, for these negative forces in the economy and the social value systems, um, you know, what kinds of public policies can we uh, create uh, to do this? So there were three dominant theories at the time. Uh, one led by uh, Walter Heller, the chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors, and Heller said, a rising tide lifts all boats. What we need to do is just grow the economy and of course, everybody will benefit if the economy is growing. And there's a lot of people who still believe that if the economy is growing, uh, <clears throat> everybody will benefit. And when we started the war on poverty in the 60s, the economy was maybe a billion and a half something. Or, uh, and now it's what, 17 trillion or something. I don't know, I'm going to look up these numbers so that I know what I'm talking about. But I'll go <laughs> straight up. A little straight in the 1960s when we started the war on poverty, and now the economy is this big. So clearly, the mere fact of growth in the economy is not in and of itself enough to end poverty. It's enough to help. And a good job at a rising economy certainly is a step forward for millions of people, but it's not in and of itself uh, the way to do it. So the second school of thought, and it was led by Willie Worst, the Secretary of Labor, <clears throat> and Willard Worst said, uh, the way that we uh, eliminate poverty in America is that we get everybody educated. Uh, everybody needs to have at least a high school diploma, uh, everybody, or better, uh, a college uh, uh, degree, uh, a community college, a certificate of some kind. So Willard Wirtz led the school of thought that the way to eliminate poverty in America uh, is through education and training. And then there was a third school of thought coming out of the uh, Ford Foundation's Gray Areas Project that said the way you've got to eliminate poverty in America is you're going to get everybody in a particular community together, and they are going to come up with ways to do it for that community. And you may not be able to do it for the whole state or the whole nation, but on a community-by-community -community basis, we can, in fact, have significant uh, impact on poverty. So the task of putting this together, um, Lyndon Johnson, the president uh, by now after Kennedy's assassination, uh, 
uh, called Sergeant Trimer, President Kennedy's brother-in-law, and says, I want you to lead a task force that, that comes up with ways that we can carry this program of community action. We can carry these uh, anti-juvenile delinquency strategies from the 1930s, take these to scale, uh, and come up with something to reduce uh, eliminate poverty in America. So Schreiber put together a task force, and you think of a task force as being 12 geniuses sitting around a table with yellow pads of paper uh, talking to each other. It was chaos. There were about 500 people involved, uh, phone calls, uh, copies of papers flying around, uh, arguments in bars, etc. So it was a very unstructured process from January uh, 64 uh, to August 20th of 64 when uh, the bill finally passed. <clears throat> Uh, and they uh, created this new Office of Economic Opportunity, the third great uh, thrust by the federal government <coughs> into reducing or eliminating poverty. We had the Freedman's Bureau in the 1860s, and the Farm Security Administration in the 1930s, and then uh, what I call the third iteration of this same type of effort, uh, the Office of Economic Opportunity in the 1960s. And the idea was that we're going to uh, empower communities to organize themselves uh, to come up with solutions uh, that will work in that community. Um, and it, it was a, a delightful place to work. I went there, I, my first day of work was June 6, 1966. I was a graduate student at the University of Kansas, just got married, needed a summer job, but I was being hired to go out and knock on doors to get people to come to a meeting to organize something called a community action agency. Um, instead, I walked in, we were at 215 Pershing Road in Kansas City, it was the regional office. I was so junior, and I was a GS5 temporary summer intern making $92 a week, most money I'd ever made in my life. I walked in, I was so junior, in the old days in an office building, there was a desk when we got off the elevator from the night watchman set. In the daytime, that was my desk. So I had to take everything out of my desk at night and put it in the closet so the night watchman could sit there on the floor. <clears throat> so I walk in and I said, bam, here's the summer Head Start applications. So I got the summer Head Start applications for all Missouri, Idaho, a few, a few odds and ends, and about 80 of them. So I processed these summer Head Start applications on my IBM correcting selectric typewriter, <laughs> top of the line technology for the era. <clears throat> Sent them all out, uh, and I decided, why am I studying applied community development at the University of Kansas when I can be living applied community development at the Office of Economic Opportunity? So I stayed. <clears throat> Best job I ever had in my life. I was a field representative for most of Missouri. Anyhow, <clears throat> so the theory of community action uh, <clears throat> was that we're going to do this community organization and reorganization and restructuring process that's going to result in local strategies to address maybe not the fundamental causes of, it, of poverty and the economy and social value, but at least as far as they exist in this community. So the rumor is that uh, Linda Johnson told Sergeant Trimer, I want this done within nine months. I want this done. <laughs> and Sergeant Trimer, being the realist, said, I'm sorry, Mr. President, it's going to take us three years to eliminate <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and Bobby Kennedy, the Attorney General, who headed the task force that provided almost all the staff uh, for the Shriver's task force, argued uh, to President Johnson, we should do this in 50 cities, we should evaluate it, we should see how it goes, we should tweak the model, and we should roll it out. And Lyndon Johnson said, no, I want it done nationwide now. So here I was. 26 year old field representative. I grew a mustache when I was older. <laughs> Out in rural Missouri, and you'd go into the town moms and dads are saying, Well, look, I'm from the federal government. We're to help eliminate poverty in your community. And the first response everywhere, well, we don't have any poverty in our community. <laughs> Fortunately, OEO had gotten the census data. And we have these inch thick printouts <clears throat> of census data of numbers of people by income, et cetera. And we could lift these great. Print out this is the old dot matrix type, you know, that came in the time. So we have these hundred pages long printouts, and you could look up the exact census tracts in that community, and you could say, Well, Mr. Town Councilman, it looks to me like what's your census tract? And let's find it on the map. Oh, number 683 
anymore. Oh, look at that. Looks like 23% of the people in your census tract are below the poverty line. And they go, what? <laughs> you know? and so you're talking about denial that poverty even exists. Uh, <clears throat> that was uh, rampant. Anyhow, so uh, we roll down uh, uh, the war on poverty in the 1960s, and the Office of Economic Opportunity at the time included the Job Corps, Legal Services <coughs> Program, Senior Service, Community Service Employment Program, uh, Head Start, uh, Senior Citizen uh, Food Programs, uh, about 20 programs. So people say that war on poverty has failed. But you look around, all 20 of these programs are still operating. Most of them are separate, uh, independent programs now with their own pieces of legislation, their own constituencies, et cetera, their own good stats, limits, opportunity costs, and unintended consequences. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, clearly, something needed to offset the uh, effects of the way the economy operates and the social value system that creates this tiered, structured uh, form of society. Some people call it inequality, some people call it social class. And so, uh, and so uh, clearly something is needed to offset or counteract these trends and the big uh, forces uh, uh, that cause these inequities and inequalities. And, uh, and there's good old fashioned discrimination and racism and sexism and ismism. And, all of that but seems to be endemic to the human race. It doesn't take much to set us off when you see a difference. Somebody's different. Whoa, you know. Uh, still, uh, it's still, anyhow. Uh, and, and a pretty good research on this from Stanford, uh, we were just reviewing this last week, that without these forces, without these countervailing public policies and social dynamics, poverty, poverty would be anywhere from a third uh, to half to twice as much as it currently is. Yeah. They, these things clearly work uh, to some extent for some groups of people uh, for some period of time. So <clears throat> there's, research now backs this up. It's not, oh, well, let's uh, do away with this completely and uh, uh, you know we don't need it anymore, et cetera. Uh, the research on this is very good, especially earned income tax credit, Medicaid, uh, and SNAP uh, as the three big income transfer programs uh, dramatically reduce poverty and then all the rest of the things that we do have some effect in some places in some uh, uh, time. Okay, so by the 1970s, Congress had basically lost. <clears throat> so in the 60s, uh, the great re, uh, the great turmoil, driven largely by the civil rights movement, to some extent by the women's movement, uh, the great restructuring. Uh, the role of the federal government, and uh, like 200 programs passed. The SNAP passes, Medicaid passes, uh, the Paul Food Stamps back then. Uh, the uh, uh, Community, Mental Health, uh, Community Mental Health Services Act passes, the Community Health Services Act passes, the funds the Community Health Center, trying to push back against these trends in the economy and social beliefs that are causing uh, uh, some groups of people uh, to be left behind, not uh, to be able to do it. So the uh, Congress, by the early 70s, uh, Congress had basically lost interest in funding this whole system. Um, 1978 was when the caps in the Carter administration was when the caps went on most of the programs that had been created in the 60s or when they started trying to squeeze them back and calm them down. Um, when David Stockman was director of the Office of Management and Budget in the 1980s, he attacked this whole system head on. Uh, they went for uh, additional block grants. Uh, the idea that if we turn this over to the states, the states will be able to better manage it, et cetera. Nixon had actually started this in 71, 72, the Comprehensive Employment Training Act, Social Services Block Grant, and uh, CETA. What's the how's been up? CETA? No, not CETA was labor. The Community C Economic C Development. CDBG. What's the what's C the how's Community Block, Block Development Grant. That's it, CDBG, Community Development Block Grant. Those three passed in 71, 72. Nixon had a whole 
array of these, basically turning over the federal government to the states from Watergate intervened, and we got three of them through Congress, uh, and all the rest of us escaped until here came Reagan with basically the same idea. <clears throat> and this was all cloaked in the language of efficiency and eliminating uh, silos and so forth uh, in the Nixon administration and in the Reagan administration. But the basic core of it was two ideas. One was it, we don't think the federal government should have this responsibility. And secondly, even if it's got some responsibility, we don't want to spend any more federal money on it than we have to. Though it was a, an ideological shift and a, uh, a budgetary shift to create these block grants where you take all the stuff the federal government's doing and turn it over to the states, uh, cloaked in the language of putting the programs closer to the people, improving efficiency, improving flexibility, uh, and so forth. Okay, so beginning in the 1980s, uh, the entitlement program, oh, I missed a key shift here. In the 1960s, the community action agencies and the legal services program had ended the old system that certain types of benefits and transfer payments should only go to the deserving poor. Uh, they ended it, for example, in Lowndes County, Alabama, there were 8,000 poor women. 4,000 of these poor women uh, were white and were receiving some form of ABC. 4,000 of these poor women were black, and four of them were receiving ABC. Because the systems were operated in a very discriminatory fashion. It may not have been intended that way, but it worked out that way when you left it up to the local to decide who was the deserving poor. Somehow, the whites were the deserving poor and the blacks weren't the deserving poor. And that's one of those funny things, I guess. It's not funny to the people that affected. That was a bad joke, wasn't it? <laughs> we try to recover from that quickly. Okay, so uh, OEO, uh, the Legal Services Program, part of OEO, the Community Action Agency, went straight at this concept of the deserving poor and successfully through the courts up to the Legal Services Program in the Supreme Court in 1968, eliminated the concept of deserving poor and shifted it to a concept of entitlements. Okay, the entitlement, well, if you meet these income and all the demographic criteria, you get the money. So from 1963, when there were three million women on ADC, the 1969, the number of women receiving aid and parental children increased from 3 million to 9 million, largely because the community action agencies were hired to go out and knock on doors to implement the food stamp program and implement the Medicaid program. Uh, and uh, at the same time, they said, oh, and by the way, there's this ADC thing. Why don't you sign up for that now because you're, you're uh, eligible for it? Among the best things that we ever, <laughs> ever did. Okay, so by the 80s, Congress was pushing back against this notion of open-ended entitlements. And Congress was beginning to say, well, maybe you got to do a little something in return for this. Maybe you got to go to a class. Maybe you got to uh, work uh, if you can. Maybe you got to do something. So the idea of entitlements uh, and open-ended entitlements and non-reciprocal entitlements, which had been established by the late 60s, began shifting back. Uh, and so by the late 70s and into the early 80s, uh, Congress was attaching more and more restrictions and limitations on uh, what, uh, uh, in, the, in the form of, okay, you were getting this money for nothing, now you gotta do this, or you gotta do this, or you gotta do this, or you gotta do this. So the idea of rebalancing the system so that people did something to earn or pay back society uh, for this uh, wonderful benefit uh, that began to grow. Uh, and uh, the Reagan administration took this idea uh, and ran with it. Uh, another big shift, uh, kind of behind the scenes, most people didn't pay too much attention to it, but it was huge as far as what was happening in the government, was in the 1990s, the government results, uh, government performance and results act uh, passed Congress in 1993, so every federal agency has to have a strategic plan, every federal agency has to describe the results and outcomes they're producing and tie that to the dollars uh, they're spending. So everything that happens at the federal government, when the federal government is sending money down to anybody, 
uh, whatever requirements the Congress puts on the federal government eventually trickle down to whomever it is they're giving the money to, whether that's states, whether it's cities, whether it's nonprofit. And when Congress puts some new requirement on the feds in terms of planning or reporting or whatever, you, you know that that's going to be coming down through the system uh, over, uh, over time. Okay, so then uh, we move into the early uh, 2000s. We're just uh, treading water, uh, uh, and we move into uh, the early, uh, this period of time where we've got uh, a very different kind of, uh, I guess, presence or uh, um, awareness, that's the word I'm looking for, awareness around social values and beliefs. Uh, and this is driven in part by uh, the social media, which most of us thought, oh, this is wonderful, you know, we can keep track of the grandkids and all that. And then here's the uh, neo-Nazis and all the other people sending messages to the grandkids, you know. The grandkids, what this funny thing? Oh, I'd like to have one of them on my hat. I don't think so, Sam. <laughs> Anyhow, we've got a, a very, the social media, in my opinion, have been essentially another layer of, uh, it's like a needle introducing poison into the American society. And in spite of the good things that we can do, keeping track of our friends and relatives and families and so forth, there's this whole other dimension of what is permitted uh, going on in social media <clears throat> that's being debated. How do we manage this? How do we regulate it? How do we? Uh, prevent uh, inaccurate messages from uh, being transmitted, et cetera. And so then we're, we're up here looking at our social values and beliefs and so forth. Uh, as a, what is it that, that people believe? And we find that many of the things that many of us took for granted about democracy and about voting and so forth, uh, these things are not necessarily widely held uh, among the American people. Uh, or if they are, they're a half an inch deep. Uh, and can easily be nudged aside uh, with some other form. So there, this is a troubling time when we look at ourselves and say, maybe we aren't quite as unique and good as we thought we were. Yes, we've still got opportunities for improvement, opportunities for making ourselves better, but we are not necessarily uh, everything that we thought we were uh, uh, or even uh, everything that uh, we fantasize that we were. So I'll give you a, 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 you can turn the camera off for four seconds here while I give you the gym theory of Donald Trump. The gym theory of Donald Trump is that Donald Trump grew up pretty much the same era I did, but Trump's image of America is 1954. America's on top, uh, women are in the home, uh, <clears throat> we can throw those Mexicans out uh, if we want to, uh, our, our war machine is the best, our manufacturing is the best, and that's what we want to capture. It, it's, it's uncanny the things that he says and does and a policy perspective that he's trying to bring about that remind me of America in the early 1950s. You know? it, this recreating the image of an idealized mythical past. I mean, politicians do this all the time. It used to be this way, now it's not anymore. You elect me, and I'll restore us to our former greatness for it, et cetera. Thousands of politicians do this all the time. You know, it's just that Trump has carried this to a level and to an extreme that is mind-boggling, in my opinion. It's just incomprehensible, the things that he says uh, and does. But when you look at it from his perspective, let's go back to the good old days, it makes it a lot of sense, you know? We want manufacturing back. We're going to bring manufacturing back. Well, we aren't, but you know, let's imagine we're going to bring back 100,000 jobs or 42, 7,000 jobs, but we're not going to bring back 20 million jobs, you know? So uh, how do we go forward from here? So the absence of forward thinking uh, is really troubling, uh, and the denial of current economic realities uh, is really troubling because it just puts us further and further behind. You know, I talk about opportunity costs as one of the five elements of any form of public policy or strategy. There's an enormous opportunity cost here when we're trying to recreate a past that ain't gonna come back uh, and the rest of the world is inching forward. Or at least we thought it was until Brexit happened, you know, when Britain decides 
uh, okay, we used to rule the canyon, rule the ways, and uh, have a hundred colonies. Uh, now we're not even going to hang on to Ireland and Scotland anymore. We're just going to hunker down the, the, the people, the picks and the juice and the selps. And mm -hmm. Five minutes. Mm -hmm. Boy, <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we've got uh, this enormous uh, call volatility in the, in the belief system uh, at this point around our social values and beliefs. Uh, on the one hand, uh, the absence of con uh, society-wide consistency about what constitutes democracy and how democracy should work uh, is very troubling. On the other hand, it's precisely the absence of uniform, structured belief system that creates the algorithm within which nonprofits and foundations and government can try new things and see if they can deal with some of these negative forces. So I think you know the federal government, in my opinion, is a great horse that we rode in the 1960s for all kinds of good and uh, beneficial thing, uh, is at the moment in neutral or maybe in reverse, uh, and the action has shifted to, uh, in terms of public policy, to the state government level, and to the middle circle, uh, the, the middle where all these circles intersect, where demography, the economy, and social values intersect, which is where government and where the nonprofit organizations and where foundations and so forth operate. So I think we've got a lot more room to try things now uh, uh, than we did even in the 60s when it was all driven by the feds, you know? And now the feds are gone uh, or waiting to poke us with a stick, you know, even though if we turn our backs and everything. Uh, so the absence of having the federal government template over everything creates room for us and others like us to try new things and to grow uh, the thing. So I think uh, the seeds, we're the seed planters, if you will, and then eventually the seeds that grow will grow to the state government level. And if you look back at American history, almost every big thing the federal governments have done was done at the state level 10 to 50 years before the federal government took it up and took it to scale. So the things that are happening now in communities and at the state level, uh, in spite of the turmoil and chaos and difficult to keep track of it all. I think these are the trendsetters for uh, uh, the, the next big wave of consolidation for federal law. And I think there will be one, because if you look at the, at the cycles that occurred in America, you know, big role for the federal government, no role. Big role, and a big role, there. and I think we're just in the federal government's in the decline at the moment, but I think 10, 20, 30 years from now, I think I'll come back and pick up on the kind of stuff that we're doing now. Okay, I've got three minutes left for a question. A question for the young man in the back. Yeah. <laughs> you know, in 40 years, Jim, I've never met anybody that can stand up and do what you just did. Yeah. So, you know, that. <laughs> well, a few of old. <laughs> and I heard this 15 years ago without the last 15 years in it, and it was just brilliant, which is why I asked to be videotaped. And if we can break that into four parts, I think the, we're going to send it all over the place. But Jim, can you put circles of poverty reduction land, these ideas that we've been uh, cultivating here, into the context of ideas? What would be maybe just a quick assessment of the good, bad, limited power? Well, I think, you know, clearly we are developing new or trying to strengthen ideas out of the social values, beliefs. How should we treat each other as humans, as neighbors, uh, as friends? Uh, as we're trying to come up with either some strengthened formulations or some new formulations about how people relate to each other, uh, what we should we think about each other. So I think we are 70% down in the social values, beliefs circle there. Uh, no pun intended. I think it was. <laughs> As we try to think through in this chaotic society that we live in, where people move all the time, you know, where technology is outrunning us all. The WEB Du Bois of 1896 wrote about that. It's true today. You know, the same kind of problems that existed then exist today. In the form, so you think of these as structural dimensions and dynamic dimensions 
uh, of how a society operates. What do we do now? And we clearly have a lot uh, to learn uh, and to develop in the social values and beliefs uh, dimension. You go to Vietnam, there are no people who are homeless. You go to Mexico, there are almost no people who are homeless because either the families have a responsibility or there is some way to earn a few bucks and stay in a place that only costs a few bucks. And you look back at America in the 1960s, even, uh, a man could get a job unloading a truck or unloading a ship or swinging a shovel and stay in a single room occupancy. He could make 10 to 15 bucks a day, stay in an SRO hotel for five bucks a night, you know, and it wasn't homeless. Now those jobs are gone, the SROs are gone. There's no way to earn a few bucks in America, and there's no way to stay in a place for a few bucks a night. So we've got a whole new level of rethinking there. And then in terms of family structures and family dynamics, the old mom, dad, two kids, the picket fence, and the dog, and all of that, that was true in America from about 1946 to about 1970. You know? It didn't true anymore. You know? So we gotta stop thinking about that. You think about housing, you gotta stop thinking about housing as everybody's gonna own a house with 3,000 square feet that costs a million dollars. It ain't gonna happen. You know? There's no way it's gonna happen. So we got a lot of rethinking to do down here. <clears throat> the place where we're all behind the eight ball is in the economy, science, and technology. And how do you make a living? You know, my, my opinion on this is that them, the Republicans are 100% wrong in terms of their thinking about what needs to be done in the economy to help people make a living. And the Democrats are about 20% right uh, and, and what needs to be done. I think both parties are decades behind the economy. We, have, we don't have a glove. We're not laying a glove on this yet. It is the national, the, the, at the point that corporations went global, it left governments behind. And the, corp, the, corp, the global corporate entities are running the economy and doing their thing. And yeah, they do stuff we like and we pay for it. We get two bucks a month or whatever we're doing. But uh, so how people are going to make a living, we're nowhere near that. I was delighted to see the business roundtable the other day. 200 of the biggest corporations in the country come out and say, our job as corporations is not just our stakeholders and our managers to make a profit for them. It is also uh, our job is to our other stakeholders, to the economy, to the society. Employees. I thought, wow, you know, shades of Henry Ford in 1934 coming back around again. But I think we've got an extremely important role to play. I'm not clear always uh, about the certainty of success, but I think the commitment to trying is one of the unique things of Circle. We've got to figure out new and different ways of relating to each other uh, and helping each other live what were your meeting what was your three meeting money, and, money meeting and friends that's right you know i think that's a good a good place we're trying to get to and i think circle is an important contributor to help them make that happen thanks will you make sure